Three is the study that uh, is intended to bring about uh, obedience to the gospel. Now, one thing that is worth remembering uh, when we look at booklet three, uh, the people with whom we're studying already think they're saved, still think they're saved. By and large, they've not made connections. Every now and then, they'll start to ask some questions. And really, if they're, if they're asking questions and acknowledging the possibility, then the, uh, their minds are in a great spot in order to learn and be receptive. There are some that are convinced wholeheartedly that they are still in a right relationship with God as you begin this study. And for those, when you get to the point of realizing, and when they get to the point of realizing, wait a minute, I've not obeyed the gospel the way the Bible describes it, they're going to have an emotional reaction. Some will likely react with a bit of frustration, but it's not necessarily, necessarily going to be frustration towards you. Some will react with shock and sadness. That being said, keep in mind in beginning this study, more often than not, they still think that they are saved. Now, we're going to uh, fly through some of the earlier slides uh, from this study. Uh, we've already covered what is sin, violation of God's law. We looked at how sin starts and how it progresses. We've already covered the question of how many have sinned, Romans 3.10. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. We've looked at the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, and identified behaviors that would qualify as sin, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Those things being said, we've also looked at, in exploring the consequences of sin, we've come around to God's justice. And in discussing God's justice, we're looking at the idea of eternal punishment. Now, having covered all of that, we get to the discussion of God's conditions for salvation. We begin on page 6 in our booklet. At the top of the page, it says God's conditions for salvation. That's the heading. The first question, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The condition stated in John 3 16 is what? Belief. When we say condition we're talking about the condition uh, salvation is conditional. Obedience must be exhibited. Well what are the actions that are obedience? What are the uh, requirements, the conditions uh, to which I must submit in order to take advantage of the grace that's been extended. The first condition that's discussed is belief. Now, on the same page, the next verse, John 8, 24, uh, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, shall die in your sins. The question, will you be saved if you do not believe in Jesus? Typically speaking, is anyone going to have trouble with this that's already covered the first two studies? No. By and large, they're going to answer these questions uh, and move straight forward. So there will not be a requirement to linger on these. And if you're studying with someone that uh, is not accepting the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, then it might be the case that some previous studies should have been done, like the Believe the Bible series that we covered earlier this year in this class. For now, once you get to these, this uh, set of questions, uh, these first few are typically going to be very familiar ideas to the people with whom you're studying, uh, and they're actually good questions for the use of the Socratic method, which is to uh, make sure you're establishing common ground and seeing things eye to eye. Get the other person saying yes, so to speak. Acts 17.30, uh, the Apostle Paul said, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. The condition stated here is, Repentance. So, if God commands all men everywhere to repent, is there anyone left out of that? That's, that's, a, that's a rather universal statement that Paul makes. Next question comes from 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. 
uh, the, uh, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, made the statement that uh, he rejoiced that they sorrowed uh, after a godly sort. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow works repentance that is, according to this verse, unto what? Salvation. So repentance is unto salvation. The question, prelim, uh, the verse rather, uh, verse 9, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you, you sorrowed unto repentance. Is it possible to be sorry for something without repenting? Yeah. It's one thing to have regret. It's another thing to repent. Now, the first question under this passage is merely being sorry for your sins, the repentance that God demands. No. In fact, side note that's worth mentioning here briefly. Matthew 18, Peter said, Lord, how often shall my brother trespass against me? Until seven times? Jesus said, till 70 times seven. Then he gave the parable of the unforgiving servant. That servant that owed 10,000 talents. And he pleaded with his Lord and his Lord forgave him the debt. Anyone ever notice how in Matthew 18, the parable about forgiveness, nobody ever said, I'm sorry? Not a single one. They didn't even say, my bad. What the servant that was originally forgiven said was, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. What the second servant that should have been forgiven said was, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. And Jesus identified that as a behavior that warranted forgiveness. Thus, he connected it with Repentance. Have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. The willingness to say, hey, I want to make things right. The willingness to say things are not as they ought to be and I, I want to correct them. That's not only an indication that something's wrong but the change is taking place. That's an indication of repentance. So repentance isn't just saying I'm sorry. Repentance is a mindset that says we're going to do something about this. So, is merely being sorry for your sins the repentance God demands? No. Does repentance demand that the sinner turn from his sins? Yes, there's a change involved. Now, we want to get past the idea of just defining repentance as a turning uh, because there is more to it than that. However, for the sake of time and for the, the, the sake of the relevance in this study, the emphasis on change here is strong enough. The understanding of repentance is going to be sufficient enough that uh, the person with whom we're studying ought to get the idea that repentance isn't just saying sorry and that there has to be a change. Now, let's go ahead and move forward. The next passage is Luke 13, 3. And Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the question, will you be saved if you do not repent? The answer, no. Romans 10, 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. But we've already discussed belief. That's going to be important to remember here because as you're reading this, there are actually two, uh, two facets uh, of necessary actions that are described in this passage. Romans 10 is describing the, the accessibility of salvation, how God has, <laughs> has made it so available. Romans 10:10, 10, 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Well, we've discussed belief. We want to focus on the end of this passage. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, wait a minute. Repentance was unto salvation, according to 2 Corinthians 7:10, right? Here, confession is unto salvation. 
So, the question, the condition stated here is confession. They may say, well, it looks like belief is required, at which point you can say, you know what, you're right, it is. And that's mentioned in this verse. We, we talked about belief just a moment ago. Is, is there anything else in this verse that, that is unto salvation? And uh, in so doing, they'll typically say, oh, well, confession is unto salvation. And there you go. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Uh, Jesus said, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. The question corresponding with this passage, Will you be saved if you do not confess Jesus? The answer? No. So, these passages and questions are all straightforward. Uh, it, it's worth keeping in mind that Romans 10, 10, the focus is going to be on confession, although two different aspects of obeying the gospel are indeed mentioned. But that being said, we've discussed belief, we've discussed repentance, we've discussed confession. We move forward, 1 Peter 3. The like figure, verse 21, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, that's a mouthful. And, and the reason that's worth noting is occasionally when we're studying with folks, it's going to be necessary for them to read a passage twice. Or it's going to be necessary for them to read the passage initially look at the question in the booklet, and then come back and really scour the passage to find the answer to the question because there are so many different ideas and connected ideas contained in the verse. This is a good example of such a verse. And in fact, it might be necessary in reading this one. Uh, they've already read the passage. The question says the condition stated here is blank. Uh, baptism doth now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Having a good conscience, is that the condition? What's well, connected to it, but let's back up a little bit in the verse. Putting away the filth of the flesh, no, no, back up a little bit further. Is there anything that is said to save in this verse? Baptism doth now save us. Now, once we've had an opportunity to, to spotlight that portion of the passage, we can ask the question again. 1 Peter 3, 21, the condition necessary to be saved that is stated here is what? Baptism. Baptism doth now save us. There are some that have said, you can't show me a passage in the Bible that says baptism saves. Well, 1 Peter 3.21, baptism doth now save us. And the only way to change that is to take your pen and to write a T in place of the W in the word now, and then you've added to Scripture. By the way, there are people that have actually done that because they wanted to hold to their traditional doctrine instead of what Scripture says. Baptism does now save us. Moving forward, John 3.5. Jesus said, I tell you, except you be uh, born of water and of the Spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. The question, will you be saved if you're not baptized? Well, the person reading this question might say, wait a minute, the verse doesn't say, I don't see the word baptized in the verse. You're right. I don't see the word saved in the verse either, though. Is it possible that the verse discusses ideas, but it doesn't use the exact words. For instance, if I'm able to enter the kingdom of God, does that mean I'm saved? Except you're born of water and of the Spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so entering the kingdom of God, I'm saved. Using that same thought process, is there anything in this passage that looks like it might just allude to baptism? Being born again of water born a second time and it involves water 
What, what's that describe? The honest person is going to say, well, it sounds like it might just be baptism. And for now, if the person in looking at this question is not willing to say, yes, absolutely, provided that the person is willing to say, you know, that might just be, don't get hung up on John 3, 5. There are other passages that will be covered in this study that are going to put forward the thought in, let's say, potentially more convincing ways. John 3, 5 is absolutely relevant. But if the, the person with whom you're studying is uh, somewhat uncertain about John 3, 5, instead of uh, going into an expository sermon or exegesis of all of the details in John 3, which, by the way, both you and the other person will be cross-eyed by the time you're done, just say, okay, well, let's put that thought to the side and let's look at a couple of other passages. And you can move forward. Now, most people are going to read it and say, will you be saved if you're not baptized? Will you enter the kingdom of God if you're not uh, born of water? No, no, I won't. Okay, so we move forward. And whether or not they are uh, fully convinced with John 3, 5, the next verse is Mark 16, 16. Before we read the verse, some ideas to keep in mind. First, you've got the evangelism uh, simplified booklet that was given to everyone that attended the, uh, the seminar in November. Um, and in that booklet are all of the charts that, that we've been uh, showing as we move through the class. Chart 21 in this booklet, this is Evangelism Visualized, but it's the same series of charts, uh, poses the question, what does the Bible teach? And it gives Mark 16, 16 as the primary verse, but please note, read this chart. Look at this illustration before reading the verse. Because you're giving a person the opportunity to answer based on pre-existing beliefs and convictions. We're not trying to bait anyone. We're not trying to trap anybody. We're not salesmen. We're not dubious. What we are endeavoring to do is simply let the truth lie on the table so that it can be seen by those that need to see it. And part of seeing the truth is going to be seeing the truth of what I am if I'm the student, actually believe. So, that's what this chart is intended to do, is say, what does the Bible teach? Let them answer this based on their convictions. And if they happen to answer it wrongly, do not hit them. Don't even kick them in the shin. Don't even indicate that it's wrong. If they answer it wrongly, don't be surprised. Because the first part says, he who believes is saved and then baptized. Don't be surprised if they mark that one. Now, for those that have studied, uh, that have obeyed the gospel, is that the right answer? Is that what Mark 16, 16 says? No, we understand that. But the, person with, the people with whom we're studying typically do not yet. So, we let them answer based on their convictions. What does the Bible teach? He who believes is saved and then baptized, or he who believes is and is baptized shall be saved. There's a very strong possibility they're going to mark that first one. Again, don't react and definitely don't overreact. You've allowed them to answer based on what they believe, and they're going to be able to make a comparison in moments to come. For now... We come back to the booklet and we read Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now at this point, the, the, the initial inclination can be to uh, ask them to fill in the blanks. Jesus said we must blank and be blank to be saved they may not be ready to answer based on what's immediately in front of them. So, there's another uh, 
chart uh, that can be utilized. They may look at it and they may fill in the blanks. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But wait a minute. It doesn't say he that believe, uh, believes not and is not baptized won't be saved. Th that's usually the, the rebuttal or the argument that, that's posed. Uh, well, Jesus said, didn't say anything about he that is not baptized won't be saved. Let's look at a couple of illustrations. And again, these are going to be in the Evangelism Simplified booklet or in the Evangelism Visualized booklet. But these illustrations are simply intended to put things into perspective. And you don't have to rush them. You don't have to linger on them, but you don't have to rush them. The illustration can be, you know, let's look and see what the passage actually does say. Before we look at what it doesn't say, let's think about what it does say. Let's do a structural analysis of Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But that being said, we also want to note that, you know, we're talking about what it means to be saved. Can that salvation, can that be an emotional issue? And when we're talking about salvation, we're talking about any sort of an emotional issue. Can emotions ever cause us to overlook what we really need to see? Ask questions like that just indicate that emotions can make it harder to, to look clearly at something. And then indicate, let's, let's just reword the statement with some, with some thoughts that shouldn't be too emotional for us. Let's think of it this way. Suppose the statement says, He that eats and digests shall live. He that eats not shall die. Well, we've taken out the words believe, baptize, and salvation, and, and we've inserted words that the, uh, the statement is common sense, readily recognizable, and we can do an evaluation of the meaning. So we can ask, once that's said, do I have to say, he who eats not and does not digest uh, shall die? No, because what has to happen before a person can digest? There has to be a consumption, an intake of nutrition. A person's got to eat. So there would be no point in saying, He that eats and digests shall live, but he that eats not and digests not shall die. Well, he that eats not can't digest anything except for air. So the point being, without eating, a person can't digest. Parallel statement, without believing, can a person be baptized? Why would a person be baptized without believing? That's rhetorical. They don't necessarily have to answer it, but just pose it as a rhetorical. So we've taken Mark 16, 16, and we've maintained the same grammatical construction but we have inserted ideas that are common sense concepts and readily recognized. Now, let's use another illustration. And again, this one is contained in the, the booklet. Um, suppose, suppose the Ford Motor Company ran a promotion and they're feeling really generous. And they said, he that trusts in Ford and is baptized in our pool will receive a new Ford truck. Now, if Ford were to run that promotion, what do you need to do to get that Ford truck? Now, they're going to let somebody dip me in Ford's pool. Okay. What if, uh, could someone try to argue, hey, I, I trust Ford, go ahead and give me that truck, and then I'll let you dip me. Wait, wait a minute, That's, that wasn't the promotion, was it? Now, we can look at this and think, well, you know, it's, it's kind of silly. Sometimes silly actually helps people lighten up and think. Here's a thought. Let's talk about the price of vehicles. Is it possible, not, not common, but is it possible to afford a vehicle? 
to afford a Ford? Is it possible to afford a vehicle? Can you make that purchase? Usually it's on credit, but yes, you can make the purchase. So the point is, it's possible to buy a new vehicle with my own money or my own merit, what I've earned, right? Okay. But if you've got the choice between paying full cost or taking advantage of a free offer, what are you going to do? Would you take advantage of the free offer? Or would you say, no, I want to pay 60, 70, 80,000, because that's what they run now if you're getting a new one, unless you're getting a three quarter ton, and then we're not even going to get into that. Are you going to pay full price, or are you going to take advantage of the free offer? Okay. Now, after asking that, let's ask this. Can you purchase, buy, or procure salvation with your own money or your own merit? Something I can't possibly buy. Now, if I would take advantage of the free offer on something that I could conceivably get for myself, what should I do when a free offer is made? for something that I can't possibly earn or merit. Should I follow the instructions connected to the free offer? If I'd be willing to get into Ford's pool, should I not be willing to get into Christ's? So, those ideas being conveyed, that's just another illustration that can be utilized. Some people won't need all of the illustrations that we're about to convey, but we're going to go ahead and hit on them. Uh, just so that we have a little bit of familiarity with them. The next illustration. Five different views of Mark 16, 16. Some read it, uh, some will say, He that believeth and is baptized sh shall not be saved. That, that's the view held by the atheists, or the Jews, or the Hindus, or any non-Christian religion. They, they don't believe in a salvation, or they don't believe in a salvation through Christ. And so, both faith and baptism are irrelevant in their minds, and salvation is not anything connected to Christianity. Then there's the idea that he that does not believe and is not baptized shall be saved. This is the belief of the universalist. The one that thinks that God is going to save anyone and everyone, regardless of what those people choose to do. The next one, he that does not believe and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe and is baptized. Can, can you think of any instance where a person who is not believed is baptized? Infants. This would be the practice of infant baptism. Has that infant believed anything? That infant doesn't even believe it's alive. It doesn't, it, it can't process anything. It might believe it's hungry, but that's about it. Or tired. He that believeth and is baptized. Belief is a prerequisite. You're going to die eventually. Uh, that's an impressive fly. He that believes and is saved, uh, he that believes is saved and may be baptized. This is the view of most denominations, those that teach infant, uh, those that teach the, the faith only doctrine, the, those that hold to the idea of the sinner's prayer. He that believes at the point of faith is saved and then he might just be baptized but it's not really necessary. So there are four different views. Let's look at a fifth one. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, whereas the previous views were held by atheists and complete non-believers, uh, applied to those regarding the universalists or then the, those that practice infant baptism or denominations, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Who holds this view? Why do we hold this view? Because Jesus did. And that's the point. This is what Jesus said. Plain, simple. So, 
Another reason for this illustration, simply to distinguish between what so many people have always heard from so many sources and what Christ has actually said. So we're looking at Mark 16, 16. At this point, they should be ready to go back and look at Jesus said that we must believe and be baptized to be saved. Now they may or may not be willing fully to accept it. Uh, hopefully they're warming to the idea, but for now uh, the evidence is, is there and the, the grammatical considerations have been presented for them to recognize that that's what Jesus said. Moving onward to the next uh, passage, Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The inspired preacher told these believers to do what? Repent and be baptized. All right, and the next question. According to this passage, repent and be baptized for the what? Remission of sins. Again, we're just letting the uh, passages speak for themselves. Now, on this particular one, there are those that would uh, seek to differentiate between the necessity of repentance and the necessity of baptism. Now, we've already discussed repentance earlier. We looked at Acts 17.30. We looked at 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, 9 and 10, Luke 13, 3. Here, repentance has already been discussed. Peter connects with repentance another action. Repent and what? Be baptized. That word and is a coordinating conjunction. It links what follows with what comes before. It makes them of uh, equal effect in whatever sentence is being conveyed. This particular sentence is conveying what is necessary in order to receive forgiveness, remission of sins. So, an illustration to note. You take a look at that train, and you've got multiple cars connected to the train. What's joining, repent, and be baptized? The word... And. It's a coupling word. It, it, it connects the ideas. And if we disconnect, repent, and be baptized, then we're, we've sort of missed the train. We, we, we've missed w w what the Lord has connected for us. So we want to focus on that word and and note the role that it performs in connecting repentance and baptism. That being said, we go ahead and we come back to uh, our booklet. We've read Acts 2.38. Let's move forward. We'll look at Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who ha hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are all spiritual blessings in Christ, according to Ephesians 1.3? Okay, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. The next question, if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, are there any spiritual blessings outside of Christ? Any spiritual blessings outside of Christ? No. If all of them are in Christ, then where do I need to be in order to enjoy, receive, avail myself to the spiritual blessings? In Christ. Now, let's move this thought forward. 2 Timothy 2.10, Paul said, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may receive the salvation uh, that is in Christ Jesus unto eternal glory. According to 2 Timothy 2.10, Paul said salvation is in whom? Christ. So, is salvation in Christ? Yes. The next question, is it your understanding that one must be in Christ to be saved? Well, if salvation is in Christ, then where do I need to be to be saved? In Christ? 
All right. One more passage. And that's going to look at the idea of how do I get into Christ? This is where we'll pick up when next we meet. But for now, here's a chart that actually appears on, it's chart 27 in the booklet, looking at where all spiritual blessings are. And this chart illustrates what it means to get into Christ. For now, we'll look at Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. At what point does a person get into Christ? If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, if salvation is in Christ, then how do I get into Christ? How do I go from being outside of Christ to inside of Christ? What is the point of entrance into the spiritual blessings that are in Christ? Yes, a series of questions that are all asking the same thing, but they're asking them worded in very distinct ways in order to stress that this is not merely suggestive, but this is what it means to be in Christ. So, the question under Galatians 3.27, how does one get into Christ? The answer? Baptism. The bell has rung. We will go ahead and uh, stop right there for tonight and pick up on page 8 when next we meet. Thank you for your kind attention this evening.